Continuing on the skin conditions, we're going to discuss the basal cell carcinoma and the squamous cell carcinoma as well. We're going to start by describing this lesion. This is part of the patient face. You can see that there is an ulcer in here, as you see in the middle. This is a, a, an ulcer. So yeah, so this is an ulcer in the middle. And these are edges which are rolled in edges. And also it's a little bit shiny, so purely and characteristic, all right? And also there'll be some sort of redness around it, which is due to telangiectasia. So the way to describe this is you have a purely papule with central uh, ulcer and rolled in edges, with sort of granulation tissue as well, and this uh, uh, ulcer, and it's purely in shape, surrounded by an area of widened capillary or telangiectasia. So, we answer the second question, which is presence of dilated subepithelial blood vessels, which is called telangiectasia. The most likely diagnosis in this patient is basal cell carcinoma, and differential diagnosis is either basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, or seborrheic keratosis, or actinic keratosis as well. Natural history of basal cell carcinoma, so it happens in the sun exposed areas. That could typically be the face, all right? Uh, and the, the direct exposure to the sun is the main thing. The, number three, it's a locally destructive tumor. This is very important. It's destructive to the local area, but it doesn't have high potential of metastasizing somewhere else, but it can destruct the tissue locally. It's very indolent with a slow progress as well. In the pathology report, this question is repeated multiple times always classifying into the gross and the microscopic. So for the gross, we're looking for the size of the tumor and the depth of invasion and the presence of ulceration and the presence of necrosis and the margin status as well. For microscopic, we can look for immunohistochemistry and for the type of this cancer and for any sort of cellular, cellular atypia as well. How would you manage patient with deep margin invasion so, for example, you've removed the lesion and you found that the, the, the positive margins will need to do re-excision or move surgery. What are the surgical treatment or the treatment options for patients with basal cell carcinoma who always have surgical and non-surgical management? The non-surgical management is radiotherapy, and this includes topical photodynamic therapy or omicomod 5% or fluorouracil 5%, all right? These are the non-surgical management. For the surgical management, basically, we can do excision of this tumor with healing with primary closure, and this will take us to the uh, complication or the pathogenesis of primary closure, and we're going to talk about it now, or also the flaps and the grafts, or let's, let's, letting it heal by secondary intention and the granulation tissue formation. And again, we're going to talk about this area in a bit. We can do curatage or use cryotherapy, or finally do more surgery, and we explained this in the previous uh, 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 video. So again, the treatment is either surgical or non-surgical. The non-surgical treatment is basically uh, radiotherapy, such as the PDU, photodynamic therapy, and also the topical fluorocele and topical emicomod as well. The surgical treatment is curatage, excision, and letting it heal by secondary intention, or excision, and doing primary closure or excision and putting a flap in or excision and also doing cryotherapy for the patient. Radi uh, uh, finally, we can do more, more surgery or curatage or um, uh, an electrodissection. How to prevent deep margin invasion? More surgery would be the best to deal with deep margin invasion to make sure that we got all the tumor out from the patient. The graft failure, the commonest cause for any graft failure would be infection, specifically by Staph aureus and the MSRA, the mesocellin, the MRSA, the mesocellin resistant Staph aureus. Following excision, the patient has developed lymphadenopathy. What to do next? If you have a lymph node, you can take a biopsy. And the best option for a biopsy from lymph node is fine needle aspiration cytology. And what is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? Looking at the, the, the pathology report, you have polymorphonuclear leukocyte, histocytes, and bilobed nuclei, all right? Bilobed nuclei that looks like 
that the nucleus will, will look like this and that will be the cell all right so we mentioned before uh, the definition of a giant uh, cell all right there are, such as the giant cell of langham and also reed sternberg cell so this is reed sternberg cell and uh, it's a multinucleated or bi looped nucleus so multinucleated giant cell and it's a characteristic for Hodgkin lymphoma. So diagnosing this patient could be Hodgkin lymphoma with this type of lymph node metastasis. The lymphatic spread can happen due to lymphatic embolization or permeation. But how does the metastatic cell survive in a, a lymph node? So what happens is for the metastatic cell, it has something called vascular endothelial cross factor alpha or type C. And this factor is responsible for formation of new blood vessels leading to something is called lymphangiogenesis lymphangiogenesis and this will help the metastatic cell to survive in a distant tumor continuing on that squamous cell carcinoma what is the definition this is the second most common uh, skin cancer representing about 20 percent usually firm and again it happens in the sun exposed area specifically the upper lip of the patient granulation tissue formation what is the granulation tissue? It's a fibroblast and new capillaries that is formed into the wound site when it heals by secondary intention. The rule of the granulation tissue, so basically if you have a wound in here, it will start from the base of the wound and it will start filling out all the wound so it, it helps in wound healing, all right? However, sometimes it overdo it, it overdo it. So if you have an expansion of this granulation tissue, if this is the skin, all right, and that's the edge of the tumor outside to the, uh, the uh, I mean, raised edge, raised above the skin, but it's still inside the boundary of the tumor. So still, this is the edge of the tumor, still inside that edge. So this is called hypertrophic scar, hypertrophic scar. So it respects the edge of the tumor, but it's still raised from the skin area. And on the other side, if you have a, 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 a scar that will start to extend beyond this edge, like this one, that will be called a keloid. So called a keloid extends beyond the wound edge, but hypertrophic does not extend beyond it. All right? So this is a hypertrophic confined to the wound margin, and the keloid extends beyond the, the margin, typically happen in blacks and Hispanics, and this is common in the flexor surface. The wound healing characteristic can depend on the patient and can depend on the wound itself and can depend on the surgical technique that were used. Surgical technique, depending on the tension and the type of sutures, the suture material that was used. And also the wound factor, whether this wound was infected when it came in or not, or if there was any kind of hematoma, presence of foreign body, and also poor blood supply to the wound. The patient factor, do they have diabetes? Are they obese enough? Or um, uh, uh, maybe sort of hypertension and the general condition of the patient. So these are the main factors that help with the wound healing. So now we covered all the skin condition, including the uh, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma, and how to treat all of them, and also the possible complications that might happen on the wound. Thank you very much for watching.